so just to, to start things off, uh, my name is Eric Malcolm. I work with the Informed Partnership. I'm going to be monitoring the Q and A. Um, so it's just in the chat as we go along. If you have questions, please put them there. Do not um, send chats to the panelists or ourselves via chat because we're not going to be monitoring that during the the, the chat here. Um, everybody is on mute. So uh, Dana, thank you for for. Uh, asking about that. Everybody's muted. Otherwise, we'd have about 300 people having a, a really wild, wild time together. Um, so just before we get started, I'd like to invite everybody to stick around till the very end. We're going to be doing a giveaway for um, for a couple of items that uh, we have here at BIP. And then uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Net Meredith, our executive director. Uh, she's going to say a couple of words here. And um, and Net, how are you? It's good to see you. I'm going to unmute you. There you go. Great, thank you. Can you advance the slide, please? Welcome, everyone. I'm so appreciative of you joining us today. We're very excited to have these panelists uh, discuss pesticides with you. I just want to do a quick introduction to Be Informed Partnership. You may know us from the loss and management survey that is often cited in, in media about losses each year. Uh, our Sentinel Apiary works mainly with backyard bee beekeepers on monitoring their colonies. We also have a, a range of IT tools that we use, uh, whether it be apps on our phones and devices or uh, database functionality to help us in monitoring honeybee health. Our tech transfer teams work with commercial beekeepers to diagnose diseases and other issues within colonies. Our tech transfer team and Sentinel Apiary programs both use our IT tools and they also use our lab diagnostics. So they are uh, sending samples into our lab. And then you're here because of this arm that we have, our outreach arm, where we're working with a lot of different audiences to try to inform beekeepers and the public about honeybee health. So again, I'm so appreciative that you're here and I hope you enjoy this panel discussion and I will turn it over back to my colleagues. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, we're so excited to see you all here. Uh, I'm Rachel. I'm the Sentinel Theory Program Coordinator with BIP and I will be asking the panelists the questions that were submitted in advance from the audience. And hi, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Nathalie Steinauer. I am a researcher at University of Maryland, and I'm the science coordinator for the Beanform Partnership. Today, I will be acting as the timekeeper for a little event, uh, meaning that I will be playing the bad cop to make sure that we are moving right along as we have quite a program for you tonight. Um, so without ado, let me introduce you to a wonderful panel. So I will introduce each of our panelists at a time, and then each of them will take a few minutes to present their research highlights uh, before we, we go back to opening the panel to questions. So we are so lucky to have our three panelists with us today. Um, so thank you all again for being willing participants in our little experiment tonight. Um, so our first panelist is uh, Dr. Scott Packard. So Scott is an assistant professor of pollinator health and helps run the DICE lab for honeybee studies at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. Uh, he is particularly interested in scientific research that can inform management decisions by beekeepers, farmers, regulatory agencies, and the public. Um, research in the McCart Lab focuses on the impact of pesticides, pathogen, and management practices on the health of honeybees and wild pollinators. Scott, if you have any slides, you're welcome to share your screen now. Otherwise, please take it away. I don't have any slides. But I'm happy to be here. Thank you um, for 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 having me. Um, so I, I guess what uh, what Natalie was telling you is that we do a lot of work on pesticides. We also work on uh, disease transmission among bees, um, and then I do a fair amount of extension or a fair amount of outreach to um, uh, well beekeepers, obviously, and and extension for beekeepers. But I, I work with regulatory agencies a fair amount. Uh, especially given the fact that we're in New York right now, and um, there's a fair amount of, of interest in this topic, um, I guess, thankfully, from, uh, from the higher powers in New York. So uh, I can tell you a little bit about some of our, our research uh, on, on pesticides, um, but I think perhaps the most important thing is that we offer a multi-residue pesticide analysis through our lab, 
So I run the, the Cornell um, Chemical Ecology Core Facility. And what we do um, is we've, we've opened this up to the public. Um, so we, you know, run our research projects through there and, and other um, folks, you know, send us samples for their own research. But we're also doing the BIP samples. So if uh, if you're involved in the Be Informed Partnership, uh, they send us samples and we're the ones who, who do the pesticide analysis. And again, this is open to the public. So even if you aren't, you know, involved with BIP, you are more than welcome to uh, to send us samples. And I can, once I have time here, I'll, what I'll do is I'll put the, the URL in the, in, the, in the chat so you can see exactly where our website is. Um, on the research side of things, we've been focusing a, a lot on pesticides uh, in terms of trying to understand what is real world risk. So um, as, as folks on this, uh, on this call might know, there's been quite a bit of research uh, that has gone into understanding the effects of different pesticides, <clears throat> both in a scientific setting and also in a pesticide registration setting. Um, but really understanding what the bees are exposed to in the real world once uh, a pesticide is released into the environment, um, there's actually not that much known about that. Um, and the reason is pretty simple. Uh, so it's just because the regulatory agencies, um, including the US EPA here in, in the United States, and then also other regulatory agencies such as the European Food Safety Authority, don't actually require for companies to, uh, to follow up and say, all right, you know, once we've you know, gone through this risk assessment process uh, and a pesticide is, is released, you know, what is the actual impact that it's having on, on organisms, what, uh, you know, what is exposure out in the real world. So we really designed our lab to try and address that exact topic. Um, we perform research, we go out and do a lot of, uh, you know, experiments where it's, it's pretty simple, right? So we're just putting a honeybee colony out in a, in a particular environment, it could be, you know, during apple pollination or blueberry pollination, uh, it could be, you know, just a, a colony that's in your backyard, trying to understand what day-to-day -day risk is from pesticides. Uh, um, or it could be, uh, you know, during transportation. So we've, we've been working a lot um, with beekeepers who do a lot of almond uh, uh, pollination lately. So we're trying to understand, okay, if you have this combined stress of, of transportation, you know, out to California, then they're potentially exposed to pesticides and then they come back. You know what are the effects of that? You know, is there is there a fair amount of exposure or not? So yeah, I guess we're 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 focused mainly on 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 trying to understand this real world risk and then trying to communicate that with you know folks like on this panel right now. So obviously trying to communicate this back to the stakeholders themselves, beekeepers or just members of the public, and then also regulatory agencies, especially here in in New York State. So I think I'll stop with that. That sounds great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Maggett, for joining us. All right, our second panelist is Dr. Judy Wusmart. Uh, Dr. Dr. Wusmart is an associate professor and extension specialist at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, B Lab, um, yeah, the B Lab there. And um, uh, in, uh, at the B Lab, her and her team have been developing a robust pollinator health program who focused on the Great Plains, the Great Plains region, sorry to help beekeepers, scientists, policymakers, and land manager understanding the underlying uh, stressor that are challenging bee health, such as pollinator uh, exposure to pesticides. So community engagement and promoting science literacy around those complicated farm to table issues are also key component of their research and extension education programs. Dr. Judy, uh, if you wanna share your screen. Yeah, thank you. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. And I do have a few slides here. Um, so my position here is 50-50 um, extension and research. So I do spend half my time um, developing training um, materials and, and engaging with beekeepers across the Great Plains states to kind of help with the education and training of management and dealing with these stressors. And the other half of my time is, is focused on um, the research aspects of looking at these bee stressors. And I am looking at things like varroa and diseases, but a lot of the time recently has been really focused on in the past and now on various impacts of pesticides. So looking at the differences between these individual and colony level effects, these direct and indirect effects that can 
you know, we know that these chemicals don't have to outright kill the bees to harm them when they can alter their behavior, their development, the reproduction, or change the habitat in ways that can significantly reduce their health. We are a prime example of that. And the reason I have um, these slides is because I wanted people to be aware of the situation happening in Nebraska. When I arrived there, um, we couldn't keep bees alive in this landscape that was filled with pollinator forage and habitat. And turns out um, the losses that we were seeing in these hives is due to this ethanol plant that was processing pesticide treated seeds for ethanol production, but they were all la also land plying the byproducts um, back onto the farms. So the images you see is just a pile of seeds going through the factory. The land um, applied conditioners that were being applied to these farms and an aerial image of the facility with all this blooming wildflower and vegetation that is very likely taking up a lot of these chemicals. So this is an, a video of some of the bees that were just spilling out the hives. And oftentimes beekeepers don't see this immediate acute kill, but it shows that there's this is a, an extreme and isolated example that really was um, highlighting the concerns related to pesticides that work their way through the environment and end up in the plants, the nectar and the pollen that the, that the bees then visit. And possibly in this circumstance, even just you know flying in the landscape itself. So we set up all these bee traps and <laughs> pollen traps and weight scales to try to find when and where the bees were dying how they're becoming exposed to these chemicals, taking samples of pesticides and wildflowers and in the hive. And we're seeing pretty high levels of these compounds. But you're also finding a lot of challenges with this type of research. Um, some of the concerns that we found is that these chemicals can be found in the soil at really high levels and persistently so. So what is coming up in the plants is a real concern. <laughs> And this research and our efforts have really highlighted the fact that this, what we're calling systemic pesticide pollution, or when chemicals move through the water and the soil and into the plants, is really not being addressed by our regulatory um, at the federal and the state levels. Uh, this is a really complicated and challenging problem. Uh, we do have students more relevant to this, this audience looking at the changes in the bees response to a landscape like this. Rogan Togash just re, um, defended his project, but he painstakingly painted bees, <laughs> um, newly emerged, so he knew the age groups of these bees and monitored their behavior. So these are bees that were moved from one location into these different landscapes. And you can see that just the lingering impacts of these residues in the landscape can alter critical behaviors like brood care, nectaring, and foraging in ways that can really suppress colony functions. The other important thing I think he found was that when you reuse the comb from these dead outs, when you rehive colonies back into contaminated comb, the queens or the colonies are less capable of replacing their queen. So he set these nukes up to look at their queen wearing capacity and found significant differences in whether or not a colony was able to produce a functioning queen when they were given these resources from control and dead out hives. So I think this is a really cr critical topic. And I wanted to bring out this um, publication that was produced by this group. <laughs> it's the pesticides in the honeybee colonies and it's the overview of, of the samples that were taken for the, APHIS, uh, the National APHIS Health Surveys. And it goes and shows that we do have some areas with some real high chemical loads. And there's a lot of resources going on for breeding, pest and disease control managing um, the bees themselves, increasing habitat, but we really haven't done a whole lot about dealing with pesticide incidences. So I'm not really sure that we can expect improvements without dealing with the high chemical loads and the risk of exposure to bees. So I'm really happy that we are having this discussion and having this panel. All right, that's it. Thank you so much. All right. So then we'll move on to our third uh, and final panelist. Dr. Reed Johnson. Uh, Dr. Reed Johnson got his start in beekeeping research uh, while looking for a summer job in his hometown of Missoula, Montana. Uh, he knocked on the door of a honeybee researcher at University of Montana, Dr. Jerry Bromenshank, uh, was offered employment and was quickly drawn into the world of bees and their biology. 
Uh, Reed went on to receive his PhD in entomology from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, working with Dr. May Berenbaum, where he was involved in honeybee, uh, the Honeybee Genome Project. Reed is currently an associate professor in the Department of Entomology at the Ohio State University in Worcester, Ohio, where he teaches two courses, one on beekeeping and the other on pesticide science. His research focuses on determining uh, how bees are exposed to pesticides and the effects that pesticides have on the health of honeybees, with a larger goal of really promoting uh, bee health in the context of modern agriculture. And, and I do have uh, slides to share because Judy uh, shared slides. So I feel like it helps. Um, it's always nice to look at pictures. So the um, work that we do here at Ohio State, I, I like to hear beekeepers' problems and try to follow up and put some science behind the observations that beekeepers are having related to pesticide issues. And here in Ohio, one of the major issues when I was starting back in 2012, 2013 was related to corn, corn planting and corn seed treatment dust. Uh, and, and this is an example, and, and, and Judy had some of these in her, uh, in Nebraska, I guess that's where all these treated seeds go to die is in, or have, have in Nebraska. But I mean, corn is planted all over the country and this uh, they're coated with insecticides. So corn is obviously not naturally green and purple like that. That's the uh, seed treatment, which contains an insecticide on the surface. And the problem here in Ohio and elsewhere is that that seed treatment chips off and you can see the dust that's formed when these seeds are being handled or planted. And the, the problem is that uh, we, we now understand is that that, uh, that dust containing a large amount of insecticide drifts across the landscape when planting is occurring in the spring. And bees can be exposed to that either flying through the air or those that dust could land on the, the flowers, the dandelions that are blooming abundantly at that time of year. And the result is that you can have, uh, you know, colonies really take a hit when corn is being planted. Uh, this is a beekeeper that, that called me out when he saw one of these uh, corn planting related uh, bee kills. And you get, you know, uh, a good number of dead bees on the ground around the colonies that were exposed to this, uh, the seed treatment dust. Um, we did a number of years of study on this and found that you can expect a doubling, tripling of the number of dead bees produced by these colonies when corn is being planted. However, um, this is a pretty brief exposure. Uh, the colonies definitely took a hit, but they they bounced back. And by the end of the season, we saw no difference between the, the colonies that had uh, received high exposure and those that had received low exposure. Though certainly beekeepers, if they're getting ready to make splits when corn is planted, um, they could have more significant effects on their operation uh, from this seed treatment uh, insecticide exposure. Um, the alternate crop here in Ohio uh, from corn is soybeans, and we've really gotten into soybeans lately um, because it's it's really clear now that, that soybeans are actually very attractive to, to bees when they're in bloom. Um, and the problem here is that there may be insecticide application when soybeans are blooming, and often that insecticide is, is mixed with a fungicide to, to, in a tank mix. Uh, and it's, it's really the insecticide that's probably causing uh, bee kills, and I've had a number of beekeeper complaints in Ohio uh, related to insecticide applications while soybeans are in bloom. And I think it's just a matter of raising awareness that bees are actually using soybeans. I mean, the problem with the soybeans is you're, you're looking at a soybean field in bloom here, and it's spectacular, isn't it? All the, the beautiful blooms that you can see. Well, you can't see anything because all the blooms are underneath the canopy, and nobody really sticks their head down there to appreciate the the large number of insects that are actually down there taking advantage of the, uh, the nectar that's produced by these soybean flowers. So that's work in Ohio. I also do work out in California. I don't actually go to California, but I like to solve the problems that uh, beekeepers are experiencing there because you know 85% of the colonies go to California for almond pollination. And there are a range of pesticides applied to almonds during bloom. And because this is in the state of California, um, we get have good numbers on the insecticides, fungicides, and spray adjuvants that are applied during bloom um, because there is mandatory reporting and those pesticide use uh, data 
are publicly available for anyone to go and download. It's not especially convenient, but you can go in there and look to see exactly how much of the different products are applied to different areas when the bees are present during bloom. And here we've been taking those different pesticides and testing the combinations of them here in Ohio in the lab to see if any combinations of what would normally would be assumed to be bee safe pesticides applied during bloom. It turns out in particular combinations, they, they lose their bee safety. And that could explain some of the losses that beekeepers have experienced out in California when they're providing bees for pollination services. So looking at those combination effects of tank mixes focused on almond applications. So that's just the pesticide work that and the questions that we've been trying to answer here at, at Ohio State. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reed uh, Johnson. All right. So uh, with that, I think I will pass it on again to Rachel to start our, our questions. And uh, again, I remind everybody to um, uh, use the Q&A um, um, to enter your question. You can also upvote other people's questions if you find them interesting, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Thank you, Natalie, and uh, thank you to our panelists. Those were, that was really awesome to hear more about uh, your interests and, and your work. Um, so let's get started with these questions. So we received um, these questions from a form uh, from attendees in advance. Uh, we tried to kind of organize them and um, sum them up as best as possible with the limited time that we have. So uh, we had a lot of people ask about urban versus rural areas. Um, so I guess this question is directed to uh, whichever of you three would like to, would, would have interest in answering. Um, so what are the differences between pesticides found in urban and rural areas? I can start if you guys would like, but please feel free to chime in. Um, so I guess I'll start by saying that, you know, we've accumulated about 1500 samples per year in our lab uh, that are being sent for various research projects or, uh, or you know, just beekeepers being interested in, in what, what is actually in their hives. So what I'm, what I'm telling you right now is based off of a data set that's a little over 5000 samples of, you know, either bees, uh, you know, honey, pollen or wax from honey bee hives. Um, and what I can tell you is that there's a really fundamental difference between pesticide exposure during crop pollination versus normal day-to-day -day beekeeping. Normal day-to-day -day beekeeping, we almost always find that there is, uh, you know, there are pesticides in the hives. Uh, typically, it's pollen that's the most contaminated. Uh, honey is the least con contaminated. Um, and wax is the most persistent. So... Um, it's sort of fleeting, you know, that, uh, you know, sometimes there's, there's, uh, there's residues in, in pollen, sometimes there is, or sometimes there isn't. Uh, in wax, there pretty much always is. Um, but risk is very low. So just because there are uh, pesticides in the hives that are in normal day-to-day -day beekeeping, um, and that's true in urban areas or in rural areas, uh, risk is very low. So the concentrations and the types of pesticides there just are not likely to really pose much of a risk to bees. Conversely, during crop pollination, it's actually quite common that there's risk to bees um, from pesticides. So just to put some numbers on this, uh, during blueberry pollination in Michigan, bees are simultaneously exposed to about 35 pesticides on average. In New York apple pollination, honeybees are exposed to about 17 pest pesticides simultaneously uh, during pollination. And that's again, that's in the, um, in the pollen. So if you're wondering about urban versus rural, I, I would say I would reframe the, the, the question and say, you know, there's actually not that much difference between urban and rural, uh, you know, in normal day-to-day -day beekeeping based off of the data that we have. But there's a big difference between uh, 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 bees that are doing crop pollination versus just normal day-to-day -day beekeeping. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I have anything else to add except for, you know, it, it com it's complicated because you have flying insects that can forage, you know, across multiple miles and may often go into landscapes that are considered in-betweens or go into wild um, areas within a highly intensified cropping system. So, I mean, bees will go to different places and 
and become exposed in different routes through the air, through consumption of honey, through pollen. Um, but I think I, I agree. I think the biggest difference is, is what you see coming in um, partitioned within the hive versus honey, pollen, and wax. And luckily, to, to kind of put a positive note on these things, most of the times you see lower concentrations within the honey, which is really important for us because we want to, you know, sell it and have other people consume it safely. Um, and partly that's because of just the liquid nature, the, the, the soluble nature of the honey itself, and the fact that the bees have to consume the nectar um, to physically bring it back to the hive. So if it is highly contaminated, they're often impaired and don't make it back to the hive. So there is that kind of um, filtering just because of the mechanism of bringing in those, those forage uh, resources. Pollen is definitely one that we see uh, consistently high levels because they don't have to consume it. They pack it on their legs and they bring it into the hive. So where that is a huge concern to beekeepers, and we do find higher levels of pesticides in pollen, is that you have to consider not all the bees are consuming that pollen. It's the ones that are taking care of the brood, the ones that are developing their food glands. So if you knock out all the nurse bees within the hive because of these contaminated pollen sources, then there's, then there's these lingering or delayed effects and impacts on the population because the brood suffers and now you don't have you know the individuals to replace the naturally aging workers that you have in the hive. So we do see this kind of delayed response between their exposure time or the window when you think a pesticide was applied to the impact on the colony. So that also complicates the research and the, the monitoring um, efforts with pesticide incidences. All right. Um Thank you. We also had a lot of people ask about herbicides specifically, and um, just generally, what are the what are the possible impacts of herbicides on honeybees? So th there have been a number of studies looking at the herbicide active ingredients on bees, and I think generally herbicide active ingredients are not going to be acutely toxic to, to bees. Um, and I, I don't know of any studies looking at kind of longer term effects, but maybe that hasn't been done. I think with the herbicides, the bigger concern is the adjuvants and the other formulation uh, components, because a, a pesticide is not just the active ingredient. Uh, you know, Roundup is not just glyphosate. It, it includes a number of other uh, adjuvants and formulating products to, to help that work. And I think it's those other components that might actually be of greater risk to, to bees than the, the actual active herbicide. But that being said, I think the greatest threat herbicides pose is by working through doing what they're supposed to do, and that's killing the weeds um, that our honeybees would otherwise be be chowing down on with the uh, the pollen and nectar that that weeds produce. So I think, honestly, I think the biggest issue with herbicides is that they they kill kill weeds, which I guess is a fundamental uh, tension between people who want to control weeds and and us who kind of kind of like them. It just depends on if you brand them as weeds or wildflowers, right? <laughs> That's right. Rebranding. All right. Um, so let's jump into the next question. Um, and this was also something we had uh, several people asking. Uh, how far do pesticides travel? Uh, so, for example, how far is is cons would be you know safe enough um, from a pesticide spray for the honeybees? So I can I can start off, but I know you two have uh, a lot of data on this too, or well know the the literature on this. But I can start off with our own data. So we're um, currently involved in uh, a project to look at drift. Um, so using uh, bands, actually, it's it's what pesticide applicators actually wear uh, when they're applying pesticides. Oftentimes, just to see you know what are the what are they themselves being exposed to. So we've stapled them to honeybee hives at various distances from uh, from orchards. Uh, and what I can tell you from that work and also some other work where we've looked at wildflowers um, at, at designated uh, intervals from orchards is that um, it's really about 30 meters 
is where it drops off to almost nothing. So, you know, we're talking about pretty, you know, if, if it's very windy, obviously, you know, there can certainly be, you know, big, big drift. But if a, if a pesticide applicator is applying pesticides during the conditions that they should be applying pesticides, I, I, you know, to both, you know, try to maximize the pesticide on the actual crop um, and also not harm themselves by have the, having the pesticide blow all over the place, it's around 30 meters. Um, so, you know, within that, sure, there's exposure. Outside of it, it, it becomes much more limited. And I, I think that the range highly depends on the type of chemical as well and the mode of application. So, um, for example, some of our apiaries, when we set up sticky traps, which are just kind of glass slides mounted on sticks with a sticky adhesive to collect dust particles around these fields, we set this up around the the, um, the apiaries and these impacted landscapes, and they're picking up dust particles through the the wind. So they are showing up with detectable levels of pesticides miles away from the site where we expect the piles of waste to be. So I think when they are airborne or embedded in these dust particles, they can move further. Um, but there is another um, concern of these chemicals when they travel with water. So if they're moving down waterways or ditches or leaching from the crop into the road ditches and then traveling with the water system, um, we really don't have a lot of information about how those residues are picked up into the soil and then move into the plant communities and how far that could travel. So that could also carry residues several miles away. And the other way pesticides can move, of course, is on the bees themselves. If bees are out foraging miles away from your apiary, uh, they could potentially pick that up and bring it back. All right. So as a follow up to that, um, let's say your apiary is surrounded by miles of, of things like soybeans or, or corn, um, and, and that's all. Uh, what would be the best thing to do to keep your bees healthy in that situation if you know that there will be sprays nearby? I guess since I just talked about corn and soybeans, I can I can address that. Um, I think the key thing is probably to uh, make sure that the the farmers in your area know that you have an apiary there, and to communicate with the people who might be make, applying pesticides, particularly to the soybeans, to try to avoid. In that case, it's particularly the insecticide applications during soybean bloom that I think are the greatest threat, um, and just encourage them to not apply an insecticide uh, as a tank mix with the fungicide uh, and ideally apply in the evening when the bees are no longer active. Um, that being said, I mean, we keep lots of apiaries in very corn and soybean rich environments here in Ohio, and we we very rarely have problems. Um, maybe that's because the applicators are being conscientious in our area, um, but our some of our best apiaries are actually in areas that are very intensively uh, corn and soybean. Um, so it's, it's quite possible to keep bees healthy in that environment. Uh, but I think some communication and signage and that kind of thing can help. Yeah, I agree. I think communication is key, especially if you have um, farmers that can help you determine, you know, when there's a pest outbreak that they have to deal with, or if there's um, time to cover the hive, or sometimes um, we have recommended when beekeepers were concerned about cause um, colony colonies collapsing during planting, you know, we recommend that they don't split their hives the same time that they know the farmers are planting and there's potential drift happening. So you don't want to weaken your population um, at the same time when there's a lot of agricultural, um, you know, activity and potential risk for those bees. So maybe providing some feed supplement or a pollen patty to keep them in the house while that planting is happening may also reduce their activity outside the hive just during those high risk exposure periods. Um, yeah, but that again, there are a um, lot of examples where bees are kept very healthy and are doing very well in those cropping systems. Um, it, this is more for like people who suspect that there are issues to add more habitat and to monitor when those losses are occurring. 
Awesome. Thank you. Um, I, I'm just going to chime in here real quick. We've got a lot of questions coming in um, and we've got a couple of really popular ones, actually. So I, I wanted to, to pop in and this is not exactly related and it's kind of hard to regulate them versus uh, the topic. So I'm just going to ask. Um, so uh, Frederick Dunn, hey, Fred, uh, asked uh, straw microbials claims. And this is maybe maybe this is a touchy one, too, for folks, but it's a good, valid question. and uh, It's popular here. Straw microbials claims that their super DFM product are products are capable of countering the negative impacts of pesticides. Is this something that you or any panel members are aware of? Thanks. So I, I can talk about that a little bit unless Judy or Reed wants to. So, um, yeah, so there is evidence um, that some of the, microbi the microbes that are in the strong microbial uh, product can detoxify some pesticides. Um, that, uh, the evidence is from laboratory settings. Uh, I'm not aware of, of evidence of those particular microbes being working in the field, but, you know, just because there is, is an evidence you know, doesn't necessarily mean, or just because someone hasn't do, done that experiment, you know, doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't actually occur. Um, I think the, the bigger question is, okay, you know, if that's actually occurring in the lab, that microbes are, are helping to break down pesticides and metabolize those pesticides, um, is it actually having an overall positive effect on the colony? Um, I have not seen uh, studies, you know, suggesting that, but again, my, my I guess my, uh, my information is about one year out of date, so it's possible that something may have been published in the last year that I'm not aware of. Yeah, I don't have any personal experience with the product or have had a lot of beekeepers that I've used that product, so I, I can't speak to that. Read any any thoughts on that yourself? Okay, cool. Um, well, I want to ask one more, and then I'll turn it back to the uh, the, the pre-submitted. But um, the, another question came in: um, Are are these chemicals showing up in honey also? That's the next like most popular upvoted question. So, any any information on that would be appreciated. I gu I guess I could start again. You guys got to chime in before me, so I don't. I'm not always the one who starts here, but. Yes, they um, almost every single sample of honey that we we test is contaminated. Um, it is the least contaminated of all bee matrices that we look at. So pollen is often the or, or is the most contaminated, uh, you know, bee matrix, um, but it's not always contaminated. So sometimes it's completely uncontaminated and sometimes it's really contaminated. Um, wax is the next most contaminated, um, uh, you know, matrix. It's, it's pretty much, again, always contaminated. Uh, and then honey, again, is almost always contaminated, but, but very low levels of pesticides. We, we rarely, I think of all the honey samples that we process, there's really only two honey samples that I've been concerned about uh, in terms of actually posing risk to bees. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you for... Uh for those um, questions from the from the chat. All right, so the next one is, um, is there pesticide contamination in honeybee feed? And if so, do we know of any implications of that? So for example, um, one, one or a few people asked about high fructose corn syrup and whether there's anything harmful in that. I don't know because I have never tested honeybee feed. <laughs> um, but what I, I guess one thing that we have tested is um, uh, foundation. So plastic foundation has a little coating of wax on it. Um, and most oftentimes that wax is at least partly derived from honeybee wax. And as you might guess from, from me telling you before that almost all honeybee wax that we test is contaminated with pesticides, we typically find that, that the wax coating on foundation that you just buy from the store is also contaminated. Um, again, very low levels. I've never seen you know levels to be concerned about. Um, and the, given the fact that you know pretty much all wax is contaminated, um, I don't know. It's it's sort of a a bummer. Uh, it's reality, but uh, but also low risk to bees. I, 
I don't know if I should say this, but all, all food is contaminated with pesticides. Um, so the, the, the soybean and the yeast and everything that, that goes into that feed could well be contaminated with pesticides. However, it does need to be below the maximum residue limits uh, set by the Food and Drug Administration. Um, there are limits for safe consumption, human consumption of food. Um, but as long as the pesticide residue levels are below those limits set by FDA, um, it's considered safe for human consumption. And the assumption is that it would also be safe for bee consumption. Yeah, I think that a lot of the concerns with feed is um, overheating and converting those sugars to more toxic forms, um, which can be harmful for the bees. And I think there are, you know, there there are scenarios or, or circumstances where maybe that the uh, environmental climate or surrounding the temperatures might also exacerbate some of these exposure or these impacts where in, in normal situations colonies can buffer some of those impacts or those exposures. Um, I agree with Dr. McCarts in, in his comments that wax is the most contaminated. And in, in some of the research, we've even found that with this, it's interesting that the foundation sheets that you get that is wax-based um, is oftentimes contaminated with fungicides. And it makes sense because often those wax come from the cappings when honey, during honey production. And those are the class of chemicals that are often allowed to be used during bloom. Um, so that would be the time when the bees are out actively collecting some of those and, and, and getting exposed and incorporating those residues into those cappings. So we do see these differences in the types of chemicals found in the hives. Um, but you know, the persistence of these chemicals, I think is the most alarming thing is that they can last in these high materials and products for an extended amount of time meaning that there's more time to mix and interact with other compounds or get into other sources of food or, you know, um, cells that might be utilized for brood care or queen rearing. Um, so I think there's just all these sublethal and indirect colony level impacts that can result um, from these contaminated hive products. And um, our focus is a lot on individual chem chemicals, but I think that discussion and the perspective should really be on the sheer diversity of chemicals and the concentration load that these products are exhibiting, not really any particular type of compound or any particular active ingredient. All right, thank you. Uh, so kind of jumping a little bit in topic here, uh, but another very popular question was, what are some of the signs that you might have a pesticide contamination um, versus a pest or a disease? And is there any way to tell kind of, or to get an idea of what kind of pesticide might be causing the problem? Reed, you had the picture of the bees in the front of the colony. <laughs> or Judy, go, go ahead. I was going to say, I think the acute pesticide kill is the most like immediately noticeable symptom is when you have piles of bees um, spilling out with their tongues sticking out. Um, most, the majority of these pesticides target the central nervous system. So sometimes you'll see with um, extreme exposures, bees shaking or trembling or having the these impaired movements that are um, classic, you know, toxicity symptoms. Um, but more often than not, they're sublethal exposures that might cause something that is not um, very visible and it, you don't see these acute losses at one time but maybe it results in higher susceptibility to some other disease so what the beekeeper actually sees is some delayed impact of you know higher pest loads and higher disease loads because the bees are cognitively locomotively or physiologically impaired because of some previous exposure. So I don't know if beekeepers can really easily tease out, even in my situation, the brood patterns were very poor. They were spotty. There were symptoms of brood disease, but I can't really discern in the field whether or not that's the brood losses due to poor brood care, higher brood disease, or direct exposure to something toxic in their food. So it's really difficult to kind of tease out the difference between a pesticide impact 
and an impact as a result of that, that subsequently just kind of makes colony function just go haywire. I think Judy hit the nail on the head here. It's just incredibly hard to discern a pesticide effect from all of the other stresses that affect bees. I mean, a lot of these, you can have, have bees dying from a virus uh, and they don't really look that much different from a pesticide kill. I mean, here in Ohio, though, that seed treatment dust scenario very reliably produced dead bees. Um, but if if a beekeeper didn't have a clear area in front of their, their hive entrance where they could observe the dead bees, um, you would never even notice that. Um, a, a really documented bee kill, and most beekeepers would probably miss it because the bees would be lost in the grass. Um, so e even in a, a really egregious case, it's unlikely you're going to be able to, to see that what's going on there and to differentiate it from all the other problems that, that bees are having. Um, so it's it's just really hard. And this is an area that I, I wish we had a better answer. All right. So uh, sort of on that note, uh, if you do have a, a colony that you suspect uh, was affected by pesticides or does appear to be an acute pesticide kill, uh, how would you how would you treat that? That colony, would you want to get rid of the food stores or the equipment? How, how would that work? I can I can start with some advice that I give folks. Um, if you're a small operation and you have the time and ability, I recommend marking those individual frames that show problematic brood symptoms or signs of disease in tomb pollen, um, things that smell weird or funky. Even if you're not sure if it's pesticide related, uh, if you mark these frames on the top of their frames or the colony itself uh, to track consistent poor performance or failure, then you have a better idea of whether or not it's coming from the environment and the high products or whether or not um, it's something else. So this is, an, this is a way for beekeepers to kind of cull frames as needed rather than replacing everything all at once. Uh, because it is circumstantial and it is very seasonal and to call all your frames every year um, might be a waste of energy and resources for the bees, but there needs to be some mechanism to tell beekeepers that it's time to remove those combs. So when you're inspecting colonies, you don't want to give up those the brood and the source and the food frames that are presently on there. But you can mark it so that later in the season, if the colony dies out or you're rehiving packages, that's a great time to say, well, I've got enough comb this season. I don't need these maybe iffy combs that continually perform um, very poorly for me in terms of brew pattern or in terms of, um, you know, whatever your metrics are. Uh, so we look at brew pattern and we look at food production and all these other traits. But beekeepers, you know, can also kind of take note of those and make those management de decisions as needed. I might just add that, you know, we, again, I, I feel like I'm answering a lot of these questions about, you know, residues in, in the, in the um, hive matrices. Uh, but what we do find is that residues accumulate over time. So if you have older wax, you're going to have more residues and potentially at concerning levels compared to uh, younger wax or younger frames with, with wax that just hasn't had time to accumulate that. We find that there's, there's, seems to be sort of a spot right around five years. So if the frame is about five years old, that's really start where you're starting to get to maybe some concerning levels in some in some of the frames. So if you are economically able to do it, um, I realize frames are expensive and it's certainly a pain in the butt to, you know, to, to swap out frames. Um, I'm a beekeeper too. I know how hard this is. Uh, but if you're able to, uh, both physically and economically, we recommend that at, at about five years is when you should swap out frames. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. So we've got some more uh, more interesting questions coming up in the chat or not in the chat. Well, there's some in there too, but we're not answering those. 
So please, just as a reminder, everybody, if you have questions, put in the Q&A. Be sure to look through those questions and upvote anything that you're interested in particularly, because that's kind of how we have to prioritize this, just since we have limited time. Um, so next question here is from uh, Ben Mullen. Um, he says, I've heard Tom Seeley speak very briefly about pesticide synergy. As I understand it, pesticide synergy is the increased deleterious effect uh, of pesticides when they come in contact with each other inside the hive. If this is something you're familiar with, would you please expound on what pesticide synergy is, how and to what degree it is thought to affect honeybees, and what we as beekeepers can do to mitigate associated risks? Guess that's that one's for me the synergy question so uh that's exactly right is synergism is the um unexpected increase in toxicity when you have multiple pesticides bees are exposed to multiple pesticides together and that's really the focus of our research in almonds on the pesticides that are applied uh during bloom there um it, it's not a universal phenomenon not all pesticides become more toxic when mixed with other pesticides um, what we found is there are particular insecticide and fungicide combinations that have great potential to cause increased toxicity to bees. Um, the, the insecticides in the pyrethroid and neonicotinoid and the anthranilic diamide classes have the potential to become more toxic when mixed with fungicides in the azole fungicide group. That particular combination um, so a, a large number of insecticides are synergized by this uh, azole or sterile biosynthesis inhibiting fungicides. These are uh, the FRAC3 group of fungicides. If you're into uh, that, that will be on the fungicide label. Um, that's the one that has the best evidence that it causes issues. Um, a lot of other combinations, uh, there appears to be nothing more than, you know, a pesticide is toxic, another pesticide is toxic. So you would expect to get the additive toxicity of those two added together. It's only in a relatively few combinations that you see this kind of surprising synergistic toxicity. Cool, thank you so much. Um, that, that was a really thorough answer, thank you. <laughs> so, all right, uh, next question is uh, is by from uh, George King, asking about is, is propolis tested? And if so, has uh, what has been found? Maybe Scott, that might be a question for you more than more than the other. Sure, one. yeah, sure. So we have tested propolis. Uh, we we have not tested much of it. Um, so I've only participated in one study uh, with actually the USDA lab, um, who was interested in looking at at propolis. Um, we did find pesticides in all the propolis. Uh, these were colonies that were regularly used for. Um, multiple pollinations, so almond pollination and some other pollinations events. Uh, so, you know, again, typically I feel like I'm a, a broken record, but I guess, you know, getting the message across is good. But, you know, during pollination, there is much more pesticide exposure during, than, than compared to normal day-to-day -day beekeeping. And if you follow those colonies, those the wax in those colonies is always more contaminated, just sort of long-term compared to uh, colonies that have not done pollination. Um, so where the propolis actually was coming from, you know, whether that was, you know, um, uh, you know, collected by the bees during pollination or at some other time, I don't know. Uh, but these were colonies that had done a fair amount of pollination and there were there was pesticide residues in there. It was not at levels uh, that would would pose acute risk to bees. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Um, so uh, the next question here is from Ann O'Hanlon. Uh, it says, sorry if this is a real rookie question, and that, that's that's there. It's all in good questions. Um, I had two colonies. One was suddenly just dead. Hundreds, if not thousands, of dead bees still in the hive. The immediately adjacent colony is just fine. My mentor believes this was likely pesticides. Does that sound right? That two adjacent colonies could have just different exposures. That, that can happen. It, it depends on the foraging preferences of those colonies. Oftentimes, it also depends on the directionalities of the hives facing, because sometimes that really kind of dictates the directionality in which the foragers fly out. And they are um, lazy foragers. They will find the most efficient foraging patch that they can. They're not going to turn directions and forage in the same um, patch as their neighbors if you know, if they have to significantly divert their 
their foraging direction. So I think it does, there are colonies within an apiary that are heavily impacted by an exposure and colonies that are left untouched. And I think that has a lot to do with just the foraging patterns of those colonies. Very cool, thank you. And do either of you have anything to add, uh, Reed or Scott? I can just say that uh, one of the most exciting research projects, at least for me, that we're currently doing is we're we're teaming up with sort of the expert or one of the world's experts right now on decoding waggle dances, uh, Maggie Kubion. And uh, and what we're trying to understand is uh, where the bees are actually being exposed to pesticides, you know, in the landscape when they're in various landscape contexts. Uh, the particular project that we're involved in is trying to understand: Can you even have organic beekeeping, you know, in in the in the continental United States? Currently, the only organic beekeeping that's possible is in Hawaii, uh, in part because there's this concern that there's conventional pesticides pretty much everywhere. Um, but yeah, so we're teaming up with her, and what I can say is that yeah, be, each colony has a bit of a personality, kind of like what, what Judy was just saying. You know, it's not that if you have a colony right next to another one, they're all foraging to the same place. They really kind of mix it up a little bit. They they have their own personalities for where they want to go and where they recruit to, uh, which certainly you know could impact you know their their exposure to pesticides. Very cool. Thank you very much. That's so interesting. Yeah. Never would have thought of that. <laughs> All right. So sorry to take it away from the chat, but we are getting low on time here. Um, so uh, speaking of research, um, but also jumping topics again. Um, so we had multiple multiple people ask, how much pressure are academic extension leaders and researchers under from the pesticide industry? And is it possible to work with pesticide industry funding and still provide independent objective research? I am definitely not going to be the first one to answer that question. <laughs> well, I guess I could start. I mean, um, the pesticide industry, at least the seed companies that have utilized the ethanol plant, you know, in Mead, Mead, Nebraska, have taken on the um, responsibility of cleaning up that site. And um, I haven't personally had any um, in, uh, notable pressures or uh, barriers to conducting the research that we are doing in Nebraska regarding the bee losses. Um, we're still in our initial phases of collecting that data, so we haven't quite published our research yet, so that might change when that happens. Um, but thus far, you know, we've been, the, the only challenges and barriers that we've really had is securing funding for this type of work, because um, a lot of the research priorities through USDA and through other granting agencies they don't like to allocate huge amounts of money to go towards the pesticide testing. So, and in our case, you know, the pesticide pollution is coming from an industrial factory, but is in a rural farming community within cropping systems. And there are community members that use urban products of the same active ingredients. So oftentimes when we're trying to look at impacts of pesticides on bees, it's not clear as to whether this is an industrial project, an agricultural project, or an environmental project. And so securing funds to look at specific questions related to field relevant exposures and impacts in real life situations, like Dr. McCart said, is quite challenging because a lot of that work takes a lot of monitoring, a lot of sampling, and a lot of testing, which a lot of people don't like um, to support for some reason or another. Yeah, this is this is tricky. Well, I I will say there is a lot of research that goes on in testing pesticides that is done by the companies themselves, and this never they never present it anywhere. They never publish it. It just gets presented to EPA in support of their pesticide registration. So there's a like this huge amount of work that goes on that we never get to see, um, and and that's where they demonstrate that these products are are safe for bees as EPA sees it. Um, and the companies pay for all that testing that they do themselves because it is, it's not the responsibility of the United States taxpayer to pay to demonstrate that a product is safe. That's the responsibility of the company that's manufacturing it. Um, and I think that's the reason there's not a lot of money in, in you know, testing pesticides on 
on bees is because the traditional view is that that the company should be paying for that because it's their products. Um, if there's a problem, they need to deal with it. Um, so it's it, it is tricky to to find the funding to do that. And and personally, I have not felt much pressure from the pesticide industry. I'm happy to present my results. They will often make their their thoughts known. Um, but I don't feel like I feel like it's always under the context of a rigorous academic discussion. I don't feel like um, it's it's pressure. They're always asking good questions. And in many cases, that makes the research better. Um, but I, I don't feel like I feel pressure to find one thing or another. Well, I'll just chime in and say one thing. So um, some of the best toxicologists, other than the other than my fellow scientists who are on this panel that I know, <laughs> um, are in industry. And I've produced uh, actually a recent postdoc from my lab is working for BASF right now in the pesticide industry. So there are some excellent scientists there. Um, what I can tell you from my personal experience is that there is misinformation that occurs. Um, so just to give you one example of this, uh, we recently published a, a 432 page report on uh, uh, economic benefits and risk from neonicotinoid insecticides in New York State. This was commissioned by our governor. Uh, and I was very happy you know, to, to work on this. It took a long time, um, but we, we really tried to, to supplement what the EPA knows about risk to pollinators, and then also, you know, they're not actually considering uh, economic benefits from, uh, you know, from these, uh, from these active ingredients. We wrote this report. We, um, you know, shared it with the, the governor and the state of New York, and we were called to um, testify at the at the Senate Assembly and uh, Committee for the Environment. Um, and I expected, okay, great, I'm going to, you know, interact with folks and take questions. Uh, and talk mostly about the report, which was true. Unfortunately, uh, the person who went right before me um, from Bayer, which is, uh, and I'm going to call them out on this, uh, uh, they went right before me, and they they said that our risk assessment was fundamentally flawed because we did not include uh, both the consideration of exposure and toxicity in our risk assessment. That unfortunately is completely false. Every single data point that was in our risk assessment considered both exposure and toxicity. That, those are the two components to doing a risk assessment. Um, so uh, yeah, what I can tell you is that there's one example and some other examples where there is absolutely misinformation that is occurring by some folks in industry. But I just want to temper that by saying there are se several, several of the best scientists that I know are also in the pesticide industry doing absolutely excellent work. Awesome. Those are great answers. Thank you. Uh, so we have one more that we have time for from the uh, form, and then we, have, we can just do a couple more really quick ones from the chat. Um, so first, uh, how can someone talk to their neighbors about pesticide use and what resources are available to help educate the public on harmful pesticides to pollinators? Well, I would say that the number one resource is the label on the pesticide itself. Uh, if it's harmful to, to bees, it's going to say that in probably very fine print on like page two or three of the pesticide label. And this is not just agricultural pesticides, but the pesticides you buy down at your, your Lowe's or Home Depot. So that's that's your best resource is just look on the, on the side of the bottle. You can also look at your um, county university, county extension agency or university to see if there are uh, pollinator habitat or garden certification programs. Oftentimes they come with a nice sign that says your your property is a certified or is been improved as a pollinator habitat. And sometimes that can generate conversations with your neighbors about the importance of forage and um, the just conscious effort to reduce the use of cosmetic pesticides or chemicals just to make things look pretty. Um, so so we have used that as kind of a, a, a discussion starter rather than knocking on every door um, to tell people, you know, that this is important to us. Um, so there has been a lot of interest in our neighborhood because of those signs. 
And I'll just chime in that, you know, most universities that have uh, folks with extension appointments, you know, have some resources uh, on their websites. Um, I'll promote ours a little bit since I'm here in New York. If there's anyone here in New York or, or is interested in going to ours, uh, we have um, multiple guides for particular application context. So we have guides for tree fruits, uh, for small fruits, for vegetables, for turf grass, ornamentals, and landscapes. Um, and we go, you know, compound by compound by saying, okay, here's the product that people are using. Uh, you know, here's the active ingredient. Does it pose high or low risk to pollinators? Um, and then what we do is we we tapped into some of Reed's uh, uh, expertise and we looked at um, all of the literature that, that has been published to date showing whether there are synergisms, evidence for synergisms or antagonisms among different pesticides uh, that might be either tank mixed or if you if you if you would expect that a co-exposure might occur. And we've included that information in our guides as well. So anyways, just a little plug for some of our information. But again, every university uh, that has a, a sort of a land grant mission and uh, and some you know expertise in in pesticides is going to have some information on their website. Yeah, and and can I just add, um, if you are in a state, you should check um, you should check to see if you have a managed per, uh, pollinator protection plan, a statewide implemented um, guidance document that talks about um, really how the state is moving forward with improving communication between stakeholders and refining practices so that they are more pollinator friendly. And if your state doesn't have one, then reach out and encourage them to implement or develop one because this really does help um, pollinators in managed and wild systems. So that would in include the stakeholders of your agriculture stakeholder group, as well as your urban landscapes and finding ways and resources to condense that into one document or one guidance. Um, we are having some of that uh, discussion in Nebraska. So if you are in Nebraska, there's a hearing uh, this Friday. <laughs> we are encouraging you to submit comments or just let people know that this is an important effort to have these discussions in our state. We are one that does not have a managed protection plan. We don't have an apiary program and we have a lot of losses. And so this is a huge problem because my responsibilities focus on education and training. When I get called to investigate bee kills or to look at disease outbreaks, I can tell beekeepers that their bees are truly dead, yes. But I don't have the resources to actually investigate why they died or help them resolve those issues. So we really do need to partner with the state agencies and the regulatory branch of you know, the beekeeping world to make these policy changes that are going to be long-term and sustained, um, you know, for our future beekeepers. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you guys all for your, for your time, of course. And we, we if, if you aren't opposed, we would like to ask two more questions and, and then one specific for you, Scott, just to, to reiterate where people can get uh, or how people can get their, you know, bees or, um, or, you know, wax or what, you know, anything tested for pesticides. Um, so maybe we'll wrap up with that as our, our final third question, but um, just the, uh, the, the last two from the chat that, that have gotten the most, uh, the most interest. The first is, um, is anyone doing research on honeybees and mosquito spraying? I live in Southwest Florida and during summer, the county sprays around once per week. I haven't done any research, but I've had experience in calls with people concerned with mosquito sprays because on the label, there are exceptions. Um, if it is related to human health concerns, uh, they can spray uh, when when other normal applications would be uh, you know, deterred against. And so the, the additional thing with these uh, mosquito sprays is sometimes they are abatement programs that are delivered into the water. And so sometimes uh, that could be a concern is when bees are foraging near water sources, they could be picking some of these things up. And then just to tie it back to Reed Johnson's synergy, um, there, we did find uh, detectable levels of a common synergist, um, PBO. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it, it's a chemical that is often 
put into mosquito abatement formulas to increase the toxicity of that active ingredient. So we've had you know, some of those found in, in um, the wax before. Uh, so we do know that there are potential exposure risks of bees getting into these compounds. I don't, I don't know any uh, current research right now on it though. I guess, yeah, I, I would just say that I, I would love to see more research on this topic. It's one of the most common questions that I get from beekeepers. Uh, and we really don't have a lot of data, to be honest. Um, there are some studies that have been done, but not very many. And then just to follow up on, on Judy's comment about PBO, so that's piperinol butoxide. Uh, it's, it's added oftentimes, you know, if any of you have seen a, a can of wasp spray, right, it's usually pyrethrins in there, and there's usually PBO in there. So it's a synergist. Um, Reed knows all about PBO. I'm sure he has gallons of it in his lab. Uh, but uh, what it does is it causes those pyrethroids and some other, you know, insecticides to become much more toxic. PBO happens to be the most common pesticide that we find in any environmental sample. A sample. It's PBO and atrazine. Atrazine is an herbicide. We find both of them in almost every single sample that we test. So, you know, it's out there quite a bit. And, and I, I think, I, I don't actually know this, but I, I think because pyrethroids are oftentimes the, the, the class of insecticide that are used for um, mosquito abatement programs, I think that PBO is fairly commonly used, um, but don't hold me to that. I, I, I don't have the hard data. Awesome. Thank you. Wonderful. And then the last question we have, um, are the various pesticides, especially neonics, and this is from Dave Edwards, truly biodegradable? How? Are they sunlight, you know, moisture, or time? Or, you know, options D. <laughs> My understanding of the neonicotinoids is they are degraded by light. And so sunlight will degrade them um, in the environment relatively quickly, but in the soil or potentially in the hive environment where there isn't light, they can persist uh, far longer. Yeah, in the, in the piles of wet cake that were applied to these farms, uh, the top eight inch layer of, of soil did not have detectable levels or very low levels of neonics, but then you move down lower into the soil layer and they have um, extremely high and persistent um, levels of these neonics. So either they're being moved down and pushed down with rainwater and rain events, or they're being broken down with photodegradation and possibly some microbes um, because there's commonly bioremediation of these compounds with microbe activity. Uh, so, I mean, they are persistent, but they are also mobile. And they're going to be more persistent in soils with more organic matter. But that doesn't necessarily mean that all of the residues we find in the soil is going to be expressed in the plants. And so there's different levels in all of these matrices. Even within a plant, what you find in the leaves is going to be different from what you find in the nectar, which is what's going to be different from what you find in the pollen. Um, and that those levels will change once the bee brings it into the hive. So there's multiple layers of testing required um, to get a really good idea of the, the fate of these compounds and how they're moving through the system. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right. And um, just to answer that third and final question, we did um, uh, thank you, Dr. McCart, as well, for, uh, for sharing the, uh, the link to the pesticide analysis um, info. Uh, if anybody wants to get their, their uh, yeah, whatever from their hives checked for pesticides, where can they send that to? Is that in that link? Yeah, so the best way is to, uh, and this is included in the link, if you just go to the contact information. So send an email to both me and then Wayne Anderson. So Wayne is a, a chemist. He's a research associate in my lab and he's he's our core facility manager. So just send an email to us and we'll 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 chat through we're happy. I mean, I actually consider this part of my job. Um, I actually spend a lot of time doing this right now, walking through uh, with beekeepers or farmers or whoever else, uh, you know, how to get the sample that is going to ad address the question or most likely address the question that you're interested in. And then once we send you the data, how to actually interpret the, those data. So, you know, we're probably going to find some pesticides. It's very rare that we don't. 
But what does that actually mean? Is it risk to bees? Is it not risk to bees? What can we and can't we conclude from that sample? Yeah, and I would really caution people from just uh, quickly taking samples and sending it off, expecting that there's going to be a big um, light bulb going off in their head on how to change their practices. Um, but really think about if you can determine a seasonality of your losses, if you can implore these dead bee traps or clear the bottoms of your hives so you can see where these abnormal ticks of losses are occurring, then you might be able to figure out what kind of sprays are happening in the in the location or what types of mosquito you know abatement programs are happening um or you know more simply in our case you marking the time those frames are introduced into your hive and putting new combs in with a date allows you to sample the food stores in the comb with an age attached because oftentimes if you just take a sample from the hive you don't know if that frame has been in there for 10 years or 15 years. Um, so you don't know if the food stores are that old. What has helped with our pesticide testing is just marking those frames, um, starting off with new combs, not all new combs, but occasionally having a few new combs in your colony. And if you're interested in selecting from those combs, now you have a date, a time uh, attached to give you a window when those re food resources were collected or when that wax was produced. Um, and that will be more helpful information than just to blindly taking samples and sending those in. That is excellent advice. Thank you. All right. So um, we are we are well over time. And thank you all very much for being so gracious and generous with your time um, and letting us keep asking you guys all these questions. This has been really enlightening.